वेलकम टू क्लास टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट ट्वेंटियथ सेंचुरी थियोरिटिकल डेवलपमेंट्स इन लिंग्विस्टिक्स सो वी आर गोइंग टू कवर ऑलमोस्ट ऑल मेजर स्कूल्स ऑफ डिफरेंट स्कूल्स ऑफ थाट्स एंड मेथड्स एंड टेक्निक्स एट दे अडाप्टड एंड हाउ मॉडर्न लिंग्विस्टिक्स गॉट द शेप दैट वी सी इट टूडे सो इट्स अ जर्नी ऑफ हंड्रेड ईयर्स Uh, approximately hundred years that we are going to cover in this discussion. So, twentieth century theoretical developments in linguistics. As we discussed earlier, also while talking about Sasur and his work, we saw that Sasur was, uh, you know, on the threshold of a paradigm shift in linguistics and language studies. he was trained in uh, philology and uh, you know historical linguistics that was the trend of that time and uh, from the late 18th century that can be extended up to 19th century the period witnessed studies in historical linguistics and reconstruction of proto indo european languages by tracing the divergence to contemporary languages of india iran and europe Sasur was part of that tradition, and early twentieth century saw an emergence of descriptive linguistics, which was primarily concerned with the description of a single language at a given point of time. But Sasur's own work in the beginning of twentieth century witnessed a very Influence, uh, you know, witnessed a, a a change. Sasur made a huge change through his works, and that period witnessed an influential work course in general linguistics. Though this was published posthumously in nineteen sixteen, Sasur died in nineteen thirteen. It was published in nineteen sixteen. Uh, this book. was compiled by uh, his students posthumously uh, charles belly and albert shashay out of their lecture notes they had taken from sasur's lecture in geneva uh, and that book proved to be a milestone and a turning point in the approach methods and theoretical constructs in language study and that laid the foundation of structuralism as a theoretical approach if you look at sasur's key concepts that is well documented in this book sasur looked at language as a systemic language as an object of systemic contrast and equivalent objects language consists of a string of linguistic objects like words phonemes morphemes all in contrast and opposition sasur made a radical change in understanding language as a phenomenon and he introduced uh, binary ideas like lang and parole we have already talked about lang and parole in detail he introduced ideas like syntagmatic and paradigmatic relations he talked about a uh, synchrony and diachrony synchronic linguistics and diachronic linguistics internal and external linguistics right uh, so he talked about sign signifier and signified right so a linguistic signifier is a, a combination of a composite form of the sound image the actual sounds and the concept it relates to and he also established that there is no a uh, logical connection between the signifier and the signified and these ideas and this approach of looking at language 
laid foundations of a structuralism. Though Sasur never used this term structuralism, in fact, it was introduced by Roman Jacobson. So, Sasur believed that language has a formal structure and should be studied in a structural perspective. And a structuralist believed that language should be first studied from a synchronic point of view, not a diachronic point of view, since the diachronic point of view is dependent on synchronic point of view. So, they preferred studying language from synchronic point of view, that means language at a given point of time. So, these are the basic tenets of uh, structuralism and this movement was spread all over out of which two schools are very important and prominent. One is European structuralism and the other is American structuralism. In Europe also we have the Prague circle, the Copenhagen circle and the Vienna science circle. So, it was spread all over Europe and the Prague school is one which is very influential in European structuralism and parallel to that we see American structuralism uh, which is primarily led by Leonard Bloomfield. Uh, you know and we will talk about American structuralists like you know Sir Edward Sapir. American structuralism was highly influenced with uh, anthropological works and frameworks in psychology, behaviorism. Uh, European structuralism was highly influenced and deeply uh, you know rooted in Sasurian work with Sasurian idea. However, American structuralism has a little departure in technique and methods used for analyzing language data. So, the idea and approach of Sasur made significant paradigm shift not only in linguistics, but in a whole range of areas such as literature, philosophy, sociology and other related disciplines. Sasur saw language as a formal system with various constituting elements and be, it should be analyzed despite complexities in real time of his speech production. And drawing primarily from the works by Sasur, 1920s witnessed an emergence of structuralism in the language studies and linguistics. Uh, the decade 1920s witnessed a shift in approaches with meticulous and sophisticated methods in analyzing language use as a system with subdisciplines such as phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, etc. And we see a departure from historical, linguistic, and philological approaches. So, 1920s onwards, we did not look at sound change in its diachronic perspective. In fact, we had a vantage point of looking at language from synchronic point of view, and that is a departure in a structuralism. Sasur so, himself never used the term structuralism in his work, in his lectures, in his discussions. And it was Roman Jacobson who, who coined the term in 1929 uh, in reference to an emerging new method which was being used at the time in linguistics as well as other disciplines such as literary theory and studies, psychology, sociology and anthropology. So, this term was coined in 1929 by Roman Jacobson, but the traits and the features and the methods and the techniques used in structuralism was highly influenced by the works of Ferdinand de Saussure. If you look at European structuralism movement, we have three important uh, you know, schools of thoughts and uh, practices. The Prague Circle, the Copenhagen Circle and uh, the Vienna Science Circle. Out of the three Prague Circle, which was 
founded in 2026, 20, 20, in fact, uh, was highly influenced and made a deeper impact in language studies. And it is also credited for leading this movement of structuralism in Europe. So, European structuralists had emphasis on the view that meaning is an inherent aspect of language system. And you have to notice this aspect that European structuralism looked at meaning deeply embedded in the structure, inherent in the structure. So, they did not look at meaning as the secondary uh, aspect as we see in American structuralism. So, there is a difference. And they believe that it is not reducible to extent, uh, external factors or references. The Prague Linguistic Circle was founded form, uh, formally uh, in 1926 by a group of scholars like Roman Jacobson, B. Havanek, V. Mathesius, J. Mukarovsky, N. S. Trubskoy, and B. Tranka. So, they were the founders of Prague Circle and we all understand Roman Jacobson's contribution and we know the phonology, right, genetic phonology and other uh, things that uh, the, the Pragians became particularly known for their seminal research in phonology and their work encompasses much more. The members of the Prague Circle described themselves as both a structuralist and functionalist. They ex described themselves as a structuralist because uh, they believed that every element of a language is part of paradigmatic structure. The sound structure of language, for example, its lexical structure, its international structure, etc. And they also call themselves functionalists because they believed that each linguistic unit as existing only in as far as it serves a particular purpose with which is ultimately uh, which ultimately contributes to the communicative function of language. So they looked at, at language from a structural point of view and they looked at language from a functional point of view. And that is why they call themselves a structuralist as well as functionalists, right? And uh, they produce a lot of seminal work in th formal linguistics, theoretical linguistics, specifically their impact on phonology is worth mentioning here. If you look at American structuralism, which roughly started in 30s and uh, continued up to 50s before the advent of Chomsky uh, linguistics in, in the scene. And uh, the, you know, practitioners of American structuralism are Edward Sapir, who was basically an anthropologist and a linguist, uh, Leonard Bloomfield, who is known as the champion of American structuralism, Zelling Harris and Charles Hawkins and many of their followers and students. They practiced American structuralism. And as I mentioned, unlike European structuralism, American structuralism paid more attention to a structure of the language as compared to the semantic aspect of it, meaning aspect of it. However, European structuralism looked at meaning as an inherent component of linguistic structure. So, that, that was the departure. American structuralism was influenced and led by Leonard Bloomfield. The Bloomfieldian structuralism declined after 1950s as the generative paradigm or the Chomsky way of doing linguistics and language studies arrived in mid 1950s and got consolidated in 1960s. So, we see a paradigm shift after 19, mid 1950s in American structuralism. When we look at the characteristics of American structuralism, 
the focus area was writing descriptive grammar of unwritten indigenous American languages led by Bloomfield, though Sapir also studied such indigenous languages. American extractivism and the approach it, it followed involved collecting data from the native speakers, analyzing the corpus of collected data solely on the basis of identified linguistic items and their distribution within the corpus. And uh, Bloomfield developed a method of collecting data that is known as observant method. In that method, you know, uh, he would call the native speaker in the class or the place where his students and he and his students were collecting data and they would get data directly from the native speaker and they would analyze, they will do the analysis, phonetic analysis, syntactic analysis and study the linguistic items and their distribution in this collected corpus of data. They paid little or negligible attention to the semantic aspects and focused more on the structural properties of the language. American structuralism talks about uh, levels of representation, building blocks of language, right? Like phonology, morphology, syntax. Semantics and pragmatics were included but not paid much attention to. So they were more interested in the structural aspect of representation at the level of phonology, at the level of morphology, at the level of syntax, sentence, sentence, sentence structures. Uh, American structuralism focused on externally perceptible and observable data playing a special attention to speech. And we can trace this influence from the behaviorist paradigm because American structuralism was heavily influenced by behaviorist paradigm. In a while, we'll talk about behaviorism that relied on analyzing language and understanding language acquisition process in terms of externally perceptible data that is speech. So not the underlying factors you know, motivating that speech. So they were all interested in the externally perceptible data. So whatever they got from the in, in, informant, respondent, their analysis was based on that. Uh, American structuralism also focused on linguistic analysis of forms forms of linguistic object, structure of linguistic object and relegating secondary place or secondary status to meaning. Bloomfield believed that phonology is the starting point of any language analysis, any linguistic investigation and said that linguistic study must always start from the phonetic form and not from the meaning. So here, here you, we find a very clear distinction between European structuralism and American structuralism where European structuralism looked at language, looked at meaning uh, deeply embedded in the structure. However, the American structuralists looked at the structure independently and the meaning was relegated to secondary status in their analysis. And this trend continued up to almost mid 1950s. American linguists, linguistics, as practiced from 1930s to the 1950s, as a structural, although its theoretical and methodological principles were considerably different from European structuralism, and Saussure's influence on American structuralism was very limited. Whereas European post war schools and uh, people who practiced structuralism and the structuralist movement, they all fall within the purview of structuralism as uh, you, know, uh, you know, promoted and started with the works uh, inspired from the works of Asur. It was more 
grounded in Sasurian work and Sasurian concepts. Though they had differences in various important methodological issues, but broadly, what they have in common is that they all were deeply influenced by the works, concepts, and approaches of Sasur. But as opposed to European structuralism, American structuralism was more into a structure, restricted influence of Sasur's work and concepts, and meaning was relegated to secondary status in their analysis, as Bloomfield himself believed that any linguistic investigation must start with the form, not from the meaning. So this is structuralism and uh, what we see from beginning of 20th century to middle of 20th century, almost half of 20th century was heavily influenced by methods, techniques and approaches in structuralism. And we have a parallel uh, you know, paradigm being, being practiced in behaviorism, in psychology known as behaviorism. And uh, behaviorism in psychology heavily influenced works in American structuralism for the fact that psychology and the behaviorist paradigm in psychology looked at externally perceptible speech and analyzed. So look, they looked at language as behavior, right, as the actual act, and that also influenced approaches in. Uh, behave, uh, sorry, uh, structuralist, American structuralist tradition. And uh, we can see that influence when we look at audiolingual method of teaching. Bloomfield himself and his, his students wrote a lot of descriptive grammar based on American structural approach. And uh, not to mention the 1933 book called Language by Leonard Bloomfield is considered as the key document or the significant milestone publication to understand American structuralism. Now coming to behaviorism that started in the late 20s and continued up to late 50s, uh, culminates into B.F. Skinner's work, Verbal Behavior in 1957. So, three names are very important when you look at that particular period, B. F. Skinner, uh, John B. Watson and Ivan Pavlov, though other you know, uh, psychologists also worked during the period, but these three names are important in terms of emergence of behaviorist paradigm in language, right, that you know, emanated from psychology. So, B. F. Skinner uh, talked about covert behavior, including cognition and emotions, which is subject to the same controlling variables as observable behavior, and he gave the theory of operant conditioning in 1937. Uh, John B. Watson talked about methodological behaviorism in 1924, and he also promoted external perceptible behavior. Pavlov investigated how conditioned neutral stimuli elicit reflexes in respondents controlling, so stimulus and response, drawing from classical conditioning. Skinner published his monumental work in 1957 called Verbal Behavior that can also be seen as a summarized document of the concepts, beliefs, and approaches of behaviorism. And uh, it looked at language as verbal behavior. And uh, the fundamental tenets of this entire approach was uh, stimulus response chain, the idea that child is born with a tabula rasa, and uh, stimulus response chain, uh, operant conditioning, uh, 
role of reinforcement, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and habit formation. So it relied on externally perceptible behavior, linguistic behavior, to de de describe and understand language. This work and this approach of behaviorists was severely criticized by Noam Chomsky, and he systematically uh, you know, quashed the arguments put forward by behaviorists led by Skinner. However, Skinner later made a remark saying that Chomsky did not get the essence of the explanation. However, Chomsky's arrival was marked in late 50s with his standard theory and Chomsky enterprise is known as generative grammar in linguistics. So now we enter into a new paradigm called generative grammar. Chomsky made a very important significant change in the explanation of language as a phenomenon. And if you look at Chomsky's approach, we can see the summarized statement that Chomsky gives in his Aspects of Theory of Syntax, 1965 publication. He says, Linguistic theory is concerned primarily with an ideal speaker listener in a completely homogeneous speech community who knows its speech uh, language perfectly and is unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions as memory, limitations, distractions, shifts of attention and interest and errors, random or characteristics in applying his knowledge of language in actual performance. Chomsky started with three etymological questions. What is knowledge of language? How this knowledge of language is acquired? And how this knowledge of language is put into practice? Chomsky talks about underlined tacit linguistic structures in human mind. And he says that human child is born with an innate capacity to learn to acquire a language. So he postulated uh, two hypotheses, linguistic nativism and innateness hypothesis. Right? And uh, he talks about the infinite creativity of language and linguistic structures because with finite set of rules, we are able to generate infinite number of utterances. He postulates concepts like LED, language acquisition device, universal grammar. So he is not talking about uh, language specific grammar. He talks about universal principles that govern human language are underlyingly tacitly there in human mind when we are born. And uh, basically, acquisition of language is nothing but hypothesis testing. This is what he talks about. And the whole idea of principles and parameters he puts forward. So principles that govern human languages and parameters that distinguish them. So languages have English is different from you know, Mexican because of parametric variations. But principally, they all share the same underlying principle. A child is born with that uh, knowledge of underlying principle and uh, the input or the stimulus is available in the immediate environment called primary linguistic data triggers that mechanism, the, the conceptual apparatus known as LD and the child is able to frame grammatical rules and uh, through hypothesis testing. The, you know, he also puts forward the argument that the rate at which children learn vocabulary is uh, self-explanatory for the fact that they don't require a stimulus for everything that they learn. So he talks about poverty of his stimulus, right? That means the input available for the child in the environment is erroneous 
idiosyncratic, incomplete, and fuzzy. But that doesn't you know, deter a child to pick up any language in the environment. So he you know, uh, assigns a lot of autonomy and agency to the child or human child or mind you know, that acquires language. So this is the journey, you know, structuralism, then post-structuralism, then uh, behaviorist paradigm, then genitive linguistics. And within this uh, paradigm, we see a lot of other developments. In fact, the native grammar itself had multiple milestones and it has witnessed a lot of revisions and changes. And if you trace the history and development of genitive grammar since 1950s onwards, what we see, standard theory that came in, so that is the period for 1956 to 1965, aspect of syntax, Chomsky's next publication. Then extended standard theory, 1965 to 1973, uh, where he talks about syntactic constraints. constraints. So, uh, you know, uh, genitive grammar talks about syntactic constraints and we have X bar theory a generalized uh, phrase structure. Then revised extended standard theory 1973 to 1976 where we have restrictions upon X bar theory, assumptions of the complementizer position and a very important tool to, to analyze uh, you know um, data, linguistic data is move alpha right. And then we have government and binding theory principles and parameters theory 1981 to 1990 and then Chomsky produces in 1993 minimalist program. So that period is 1990s onwards till date we have minimalist program uh, is a line of inquiry that hypothesizes that human language faculty is optimal containing only what is necessary to meet human psych physical and communicative needs and seeks to identify the necessary properties of such a system. It was proposed by Chomsky in 1993. So this is the development in linguistics it's starting from Sassur uh, and the 1916 publication of his course in general linguistics to uh, structuralism and uh, you know Sassur's work, then Edward Sapir's work, then Leonard Bloomfield and his major work published in language uh, 1937 onwards and then the approach and methods, his observant method, uh, emphasis on understanding the structure of the language and talking about building blocks of language, levels of representation. Then we have uh, parallel to that American structuralism, we have uh, European structuralism and then we get into behaviorist paradigm. Behaviorist paradigm had deep influence on the structuralism of specifically American structuralism and then in 1957 onwards we find arrival of Chomsky and Chomsky linguistics known as generative grammar and uh, you know in response to Chomsky uh, Generative grammar, we have many other linguists coming with parallel proposals, contradictory proposals. Uh, among them, you know, uh, very important work by M. A. K. Halliday, Systemic Functions of Language, Systemic Grammar, that he worked on. Then, uh, you know, relational grammar for that matter, context free grammar for that matter. So, lots of uh, developments from 1950s to 1990s. And uh, then during that period, a parallel approach was, you know, uh, evolving, which, I mean, Chomsky looked at linguistics from computational point of view, right, underlying the structures and how human mind computes these structures. So mental, it is also called mentalism. And uh, Chomsky paid a lot of attention on competence. He talks about linguistic competence. So he paid lots of attention about the underlined structures and their functions. In opposed to that, we have people like Delhams, 
who talked about communicative competence, paying a lot of attention to language in use. So Chomsky talks about more about computational aspect of linguistics, of language and human mind and paying less attention to performance. So he is more concerned about linguistic competence and he says that the goal of linguistic theory should be to predict the universal principles and the computation of data in human mind. But you know opposed to that we have Delheim's people like Delheim's people like M. K. Halliday who are talking about language in actual use, language in uh, in a social cultural context and Delheim's comes up with communicative competence in 1970, 72 for that matter. Uh, Halliday talks about systemic functions of language uh, and the language acquisition by human child. He talks about seven systemic functions. If you want to know more about systemic functions, you can see M.K. Halliday's systemic function. The video we have already done. You can also watch the video that you did on exclusively on uh, Chomsky and linguistic competence. You can understand and see the video on uh, Delheim's communicative competence that we did in detail. And if you want to understand Chomsky and linguistics, you can see the innateness hypothesis that we did in a particular video. You can also understand uh, behaviorism and behaviorist approach in language acquisition that we did in separate video. But during that time, another movement was taking place and an, a, a sub-discipline of linguistics later on, it is called social linguistics, emerged during 1960s with various techniques and methods up, up, you know, applied by uh, different scholars away from these developments, a parallel development of, of this sort. And uh, the few founding you know, pillars of this discipline are William Lebov, for that matter, who pioneered a school uh, devoted to showing the relevance of social determinants of variation for linguistic theory. And he established that linguistic structures are parallel to social structures and they are related. Then we have person like Basil Bernstein, a British sociologist who worked on class related codes to class and codes. His work was severely criticized on account of different reasons, but he was the one who talked about class and code. So language restricted code, elaborate code. Uh, Delheims, another important uh, founding father of social linguistics who shaped the ethnography of communication and educational linguistics who molded social linguistics by editing several pioneer volumes and the flagship journal Language in Society. And then we have John Gumpers known better for his interactional social linguistics. So they are all talking about language in action, language in use, language in a social cultural space. So they are not talk talking like Chomsky and generative grammar. Uh, abstractness in in terms of abstractness of linguistic structures, but actually they are talking about the concrete realization of it in a particular socio-cultural space. Uh, Charles Ferguson's work in Diaglossia, very important milestone publication. Joshua Fishman's approach in sociology of language. Uh, similarly, uh, William Wright, who studied native languages and cultures of California, research on Native American languages. Ellen Grimshaw, who looked at language in a social context. Einar Hugen, who looked at bilingualism and language shift. He was the first linguist to write about ecology of language and also talked about language planning and policy. Uriel Wenrich, and uh, his work on understanding language contact, causes and effects, minority languages and language vitality, language revival. Similarly, Suzanne, so Sue Irwin Tripp, Suzanne Irwin Tripp talked about distinction between compound and coordinate bilingualism, child language acquisition, etc. 
So this was a parallel development, parallel to other theoretical developments in the field, and this is the journey of linguistics, modern linguistics in 20th century. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you know emergence of social linguistics more in our next video, and uh, I hope that you are now able to trace the history of theoretical developments in linguistics right from uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, his work, you know, birth of structuralism, practice of structuralism, spread of structuralism, till 1950s, structuralism dominated uh, half of a century. And then we see arrival of Chomsky, generative grammar, and uh, also see the severe criticism of behaviorist paradigm of language, arrival of generative grammar. Generative grammar has gone multiple changes, revisions, and now Today we have minimalist program and parallel to this a number of other programs, other approaches, other theories also developed and a sub discipline came out. Out of all these is modern social linguistics and these are the founding fathers of modern social linguistics. So thank you very much for now, we will meet in our next class.